Um, <clears throat> good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Clackamas County Board of Commissioners Policy Session on March 29, 2023. County Administrator Gary Schmidt, you're up. Thank you, Chair Smith. The first item is for Water Environment Services. If you would please convene as the Water Environment Services Board. I will recess as the Board of County Commissioners and convene as the Water Environment Services Board. This is Water Environment Services Rules and Standards Update, Part 2 of 2. Uh, Greg Geis, the Director of Water Environment Services, and Ron Wierenga, the Assistant Director, will present. Go ahead, please. Uh, good morning, Chair Smith and Commissioners. My name is Greg Geis, Director of Water Environment Services. Uh, Ron's going to present today. It's going to look a lot like it did during Part 1, where we're going to walk through kind of the process and then focus on the key policy areas that we're um, updating on our rules. Take it away, Ron. Great. Thanks, Greg. Uh, Ron Wierenga with Wes. Good morning, Chair Smith, Commissioners. Um, as Greg said, this is... Uh, Part two of our presentation to you on our on our rules and regulations update and associated technical standards. Um, we met previously to go over the project itself, do some background as well as some of our 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 financial and administrative policies. I'm looking for your input and concurrence. And today we're going to talk about um, some of our technical standards as well. Um, again, the our overarching goal is to is to get you as familiar as we can and comfortable with the proposals um, as we move towards public hearing. And, and if we achieve that objective today, then we will get public hearings scheduled. That'll be the request at the end is, is, to, is to have hearings to adopt the rules and standards. Today, the conversation is gonna be uh, a little more technical in nature. It's more about the standards themselves, which are technical standards, just so you know, are are developed by district staff, or our engineering and, and planning staff, and adopted by the district director. That's how it's been for um, quite some time, and, and we're not proposing changing that. Um, we did have, and, and I'll, I'll circle back to the project a little bit, is, but if you remember, and I spoke before, I said we did a lot of listening during this rule and standard update, and there were a few technical issues that we heard quite a bit about from the development and the development engineering community, um, some watershed councils and things like that, that we just want to make you aware of. Um, I think it's important that you're aware of those conversations, and so we're going to try and tackle that today. Um, for folks... Uh, that, that perhaps didn't see the first presentation, I want to roll back a little bit about our project itself. We are, we are doing a full comprehensive update of our rules and regulations that govern the district um, and our technical standards. Our goals are to streamline um, and consolidate our rules and standards into one um, set of, set of uh, authority and standards for us to, to use in our districts to improve a regional alignment and to, and to update um, and modernize some of the, the things that we're working on. So that's what we're after. Uh, we showed this slide last time as well. It just sort of drives home that previously before we formed West as a partnership of our service districts, there were separate rules and regulations and standards that uh, applied to those districts. And it was, it was you know, a, a fairly, it was comprehensive, but it was also a, a fairly tedious process to keep everything aligned. And, and so what we're proposing doing is, is consolidate, consolidating everything into one set of rules and regulations. It should really help with clarity, should help people understand what they need to do, and, and we should be able to administer it um, much more efficiently. So that's what we're after as well. As we said last time, we really started this project by listening. Um, we were listening to the to the people that are uh, impacted by and use our rules and regulations and standards. We pulled a technical team together, um, a task force, and, and vetted a lot of these these technical issues that we're going to talk about today. Um, we it was an iterative process with that task force as well as our West Advisory Committee. We spent quite a bit of time talking to them about these policies as well, making sure we had a good proposal um, to bring to you. But I, I really want to underscore we had a pretty deep we feel pretty deep public engagement um, and public outreach and, and also received a lot of input from folks. We did get quite a few recommendations. Um, those were around a lot of fiscal policies and administrative stuff that we talked about last time. There weren't many concerns with our technical standards when it came to sanitary sewer, but we had quite a few conversations about stormwater management and, and how um, our standards impact people um, in, in ways to potentially provide some improvement, and we'll talk about those. But quite a bit of, of input and listening. So as we roll, uh, that's the main presentation part. Last time I, we did this, and I think it worked pretty well, we have three policy key policy areas to talk to you today about, and we'll present those and then um, get 
answer questions and get input as we go. Um, our biggest challenge will be time getting that done uh, by 1030. And so we want to keep on track with that. One of our, our first uh, policies that is, is in our sanitary standards has to do generally with sanitary sewer design. And now this is fairly technical to talk about, but I think it's important. Um, as I said, we did hear about it quite a bit. Uh, the district currently allow, it requires a minimum slope of, of pipes that are installed, sanitary sewer pipes, in order to keep not only, not only the wastewater moving, but provide you know, enough, enough velocity to move solids and clean pipes, things like that. Generally, our policy is, is a minimum slope of 1%. We'll allow 2% in certain circumstances. Um, they need to be a little steeper uh, if there's not a lot of connections. Um, our, the, the challenge with that is that we, we, don't, we rarely go below 1% and there's often a need for, due to site constraints and elevations for people to try and design their pipes at a shallower um, slope. It's okay, it works in some situations, but if it doesn't work, then it hands us a significant operation and maintenance responsibility and increases the risk of backup. So we're uh, backups in the system. So we're pretty focused on, on making sure we get what we need the proposal that we uh, that we put on the table for folks, and that is now in our rules and standards, was to allow for shallower pipe slopes if there's enough connections to that pipe to keep the wastewater moving. There's a lot of math and there's calculations behind that, um, but we 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 created a simple system. Our permit staff created a pretty simple system that um, you know our our standard is one percent will allow a shallower slope of 0.75% if, if uh, pipes are serving 20 to 40 units um, or homes and, and as low as 0.5% if they're serving greater than 40 homes. It's a simple process that people can use um, to, to do their design. A lot of the conversation we had, particularly with the Home Builders Association, was around potentially even allowing shallower slopes than 0.5%. We get pretty nervous about that. Um, so we did include uh, an off-ramp, and that's the, the last bullet on policies uh, change in this slide where we added a provision allowing the design, um, and if it come, the, the design to propose a shallower pipe slope if they comply with the, the Oregon guidelines on designing sanitary sewer systems. They can do the math, and they can show that there will be enough velocity to keep the wastewater moving, and we would accept that. It's a backstop. Can interject a quick question? Of course. Commissioner West, thank you. Um, yeah, so this is all new to me because I know nothing about this topic. Um, but are, are you saying currently that you allow for the policy is 1% to 2%? Am I correct in understanding that? Yes. And you're willing to narrow that and make it less of a slope? Uh, and you think that's okay because we have a bunch of math and the quantity of homes all participating within the flow of however that works uh, allows us to go I, probably significantly less of a slope at 0.5, yeah. potentially, right? That's significantly different than, than where we're at. It is. Um, uh, and, and, and so making that significant of a change, you don't think, does it increase our likelihood to have, you know, bad sewer outcomes? <clears throat> or, or is it like... Is there something wrong with the way we have been doing it that we have to make this? I would say like the, way that, the way that we were doing it was pretty conservative to ensure that we, under no circumstances, would have um, maintenance problems or, or backups. And we've refined our understanding. And um, under certain circumstances, if, if we have projected flows that will, um, we're, we're comfortable lessening that, restrict, that, that slope um, under certain circumstances. Um, does this make it easier to develop additional properties where yes. we're, we're taking, you think, an unnecessary conservative mm -hmm. regulation and making it more broad for industry to be able to develop in more areas? Is that why we're doing this? So for certain sites, yes. There are certain sites, just depending on elevations, that this can be a significant constraint for them. And rather than deal with it through a variance process, we're allowing something that we, f we feel comfortable with, Commissioner, that... You know, you know, it's possible that we could be taking on more risk. It depends on how people use their connections. You know, we have a, if you abuse your sewer connection, then certainly we could get more backups. But um, we think we think it's a reasonable approach. Okay, I would trust you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Commissioner Savas. Well, 
couple things. Uh, first of all, I, I agree there's not enough time here today, 30 minutes, to really cover all of this, and we're only on the first one here. Um, so it is about elevations, and I, I certainly understand that. I know a number of people that do this work, uh, including plumbers, and of course they like all the slope in the world, right? Yeah. So that it, you know, it, it leaves, it doesn't cause any restrictions, but the burden, potential burden of having too little for people that, I won't say abuse the system, but they don't know better, right? Um, the burden's on the, on the property owner if they end up with continual, you know, calls to the plumber, which are not cheap. Right. So I think that I want to be me so we're mindful of the constituents we're serving, you know, um, God bless them all. But, you know, they're, they don't sometimes know. They think when they, you know, flush the toilet, it's going to magically going to go away without any problems. But reducing the slope, uh, you know, I don't know how many plumbers would, you know, complain sometimes because of failing of, of their, their those failures are sometimes caused by inadequate slope. Right. And it, it, that's true. And um, these are, just to be clear as well, these are for, for the local sewers, main lines, not so much service connections. There's different design requirements for service oh, connections. I was, I was but throw, it's still, I'll stone off by your, by your next slide then, or the yeah, picture of the home. Yeah, we'll, we'll get into that as well. Okay. Well, that's even a bigger problem then, isn't it? Um, well, again, it's the, the, the system that we've developed. We think that we, we, we can allow for some shallower slopes as long as there's enough flow in the system to move things along. That one percent, you know, like we said, we we have two percent now on dead end lines that might only have a couple connections. Um, you run a higher risk. But where we're allowing 0.75 percent for up to 20 to 40 homes that are connected to it, um, it's it still ties back to the equations that are used for the 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 Oregon guidelines on designing sanitary sewer. It's just a simpler method for determining the pipe slope. But we think we think we'll get enough flow to move things along. Well, the the only. Um and I know this is probably deep in the weeds, but um, the other experience I've heard of when it comes to conveyance is that when they put in all this, all these facilities, and of course they have to have the right fill and all that other stuff, but you know, the, as the ground starts to move, you can have it go the wrong way because just, just of, of the natural settling that takes place from opening up the earth. Um, and I, you know, what happens is it becomes a conduit, right? That gravel that they put down there, under, you know, the water will find its way, and it, it sometimes changes the grade significantly. It could go the bit for the better, and it could go for the worse. Yeah. So, I mean, that's something that would be a burden on, on the district um, if, the, if that settling goes the wrong way. Right. That's, that's why we inspect and make sure that we're as comfortable as we possibly can. But that, that does happen, and we have hundreds in, of miles of pipe in the ground. <clears throat> yeah, but when you make it that narrow, that, that's, that's the risk. I want, you know, and I, I, we don't have very much time to talk about this, yep. but um, that, that's the risk. Yeah, and we certainly, uh, Commissioner, we, we, we've talked quite a bit about that, and we talked about with that with the home builders as well, that we don't want everybody laying sewer pipes down at 0.75%. So it is, a, it, it, is, it is dependent on site constraints as well. It's an allowance. The, the standard is still uh, 1%, but we allow to go below it in certain circumstances. Okay, uh, that's that's the Go first. Go ahead, please. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this the second piece is is about service connections. Like Commissioner Savas was just referring to, uh, this this diagram is just a quick anatomy of a service connection. You have a building and uh, plumbing connected to it, um, a sanitary sewer a service connection that comes out of the building ties into the main line, um, that typically nowadays goes to the street. Most most sewer pipes are in streets. Sometimes they're on in back lot back lines of properties. It's wherever gravity uh, suits the development. But for this, for the most part, when we're talking about a service connection, it's a continuous pipe from a building to a main line. Um, that's how they work. Our our policy issue to discuss is more about the ownership and the and the operation and maintenance of that service connection. Um, it's our, our goal with this pilot, with this this update to our standards is to clarify what has really been a long-standing practice for the district, and that is that the, the operational and maintenance responsibility of a service connection is the responsibility of the owner, and the owner of a service connection is the owner of the building that is connected to the connection and the main line. Um, so, so what that does, what that generally does for us is if, if if you if you have a blockage in your service connection because you're flushing wipes or grease or something like that, you know that's your responsibility to 
to correct all the way to the main line and the connection with the main line that's, that's, that would be in a right of way. The challenge with that policy uh, is more about repairing structural defects. And we see that happen quite a bit. Like Commissioner Savas was saying, you know, grounds settle, things happen, service connections run into issues. It became a really big deal during real estate transactions. And, and, and we end up having a lot of conversations about whose responsibility is it to deal with a structural defect in a service connection that is on someone's property or under the street. Um, what we're proposing in this change, to clarify in this change is that the building owner is responsible for owning, operating, maintaining the pipeline all the way to the connection to the main line um, within a right of way or public easement. Where that changes is if there is a structural defect as determined by the district. So if someone comes to us and they said, hey, I had my sewer connection, my service connection scoped, there's a break, it's under the street. Um, where there is a structural defect as determined by the district and at the district's discretion, um, we will make the repairs. It's a compromise between what we, when we benchmark and we look at what other jurisdictions do, it could go either way. Some people take ownership all the way, some people limit their, their responsibility. Um, and we, we think this is, this is the most reasonable approach um, to managing these service connections. We don't wanna put people in a difficult situation to repair a structural defect um, in, a, in a complicated environment to fix. This doesn't happen very often. Um, I, don't, I can't say how many times a year it's gonna happen, but when it does happen, we would take on the burden of fixing that. Um, again, we get clear assignment of responsibility for different activities on the, on the service connection, and it does reduce our financial uh, liability and overflow risk because right now it's we're getting involved in structural repairs that aren't under streets because it's not very clear what our policy is. Can I just say yep, one thing, Chair? Yep, yep. I, you probably are going to say what I'm thinking, but go yeah. ahead. I just want you know it, you might we might all think up here on the dais that we'll never have to worry about this, but we have had many situations where a neighborhood or a community <coughs> somehow has their basement fill up or they have a and and there's sewage all over their house because of a design de defect or whatnot, or a plug is being plugged because of stuff, and cumulatively, it causes a backup because there wasn't enough grade and fall. So, um, and when those things happen, my gosh, I mean, just imagine your home being mm -hmm. filled partially with sewage. Um, and I have seen that, and you're right, but please continue. Yeah, I just want to just say that th this is not, this is something we need to be mindful of, um, and. If we're going to write down, I appreciate actually, frankly, having the discussion and making sure that we are, we're keeping everyone's best interest in mind. Because the cost to remedy something like this is long term. I mean, I don't know, orders of magnitude, it's damn expensive to dig up a street and relay a line, yeah. let alone how do you change elevations? Um, and, oh, are you done? Yeah. Okay. So I've toured <clears throat> in unincorporated Clackamas County some issues with water, rain, uh, rainwater runoff that causes flooding. And some of these residents, these neighborhoods, <clears throat> are on a slope and their driveways get washed out. And so the landowners go out and they put bumpers along their driveway so the water doesn't circle back into their house. But one house in particular, these poor, oh my gosh, the, the, these poor landowners, you probably know what I'm talking about, how homeowners. And you talk about you will take responsibility for a structural defect. And I have two questions regarding on this. Can you define what a structural defect is? A crack, um, a misalignment. So a structural defect is not the fact that it was installed improperly, not allowing for the right slope so rainwater is diverted to the proper place. That's not a structural defect? So just, just to be clear, Chair, um, we're talking about the, the sanitary sewer connection from the house, from the toilet out into the street. All right. Not, yeah. Okay, but rainwater <clears throat> is also an issue. Do you address that in any of these reports you presented to us? Mm -hmm. Where, where this, this would apply to um, downspout connections that do connect to main lines and streets on stormwater as well. Mm -hmm. And so if there is a structural defect, you know, I, I don't know if this is your question, Chair, but w it, if it's a problem because it was improperly installed, it's still a structural defect. Okay. Well, that's good to know. But, but it then, could be 20 years later, 
right? Well, yeah, exactly. I mean, it's, we're talking maybe 30 years. Yeah. And everybody is built around it, and the county obviously gave uh, awarded building permits for new construction and, and infill, which we're being pressured <coughs> to do, uh, the growth factors. And so that's going to have, uh, like you squeeze a water balloon, you do over here and it's going to squirt down here right. into existing neighborhoods. Also, you talk about structural defect, but in the next, next paragraph, you talk about reduced financial risk to the district. And I understand that, but how do you weigh <coughs> accepting responsibility for a structural defect mm, and taking a look at it, gee, that's going to be too expensive, we're not going to do it. How do you balance those two? Well, um, if I can say, I, I think the balance is, is if somebody's, you know, flushing wipes and, and fats and oils and greases and it results in a, a, a clog that's, say, out in the street before it gets into the main line. Can you see that? We do, yes. Okay. But because of the, our rules are ambiguous right now, we, we would take responsibility for that. We would flush that, clean it, and potentially be on the hook if that caused a backup into their home. And so what this says is that the owner is responsible for that kind of thing all the way to the main line. Okay. But if there's a, a crack in the main line um, caused by tra heavy traffic, settling of the road, whatever, that then we would step in and take care of that structural defect. And once these new rules pass, are you going to be notifying all the people don't do this because it could affect yeah, the well. performance of your, because you know some people may not know you're not supposed to flush wipes. Yeah, oh, they, well, our customers have certainly been notified more than a, a dozens and dozens of times. Well, yeah. you know, if the board approves these new rules going forward, I think you really need to condense them into r easy uh, mm -hmm. talking points to let them know that they too can help in maintaining our sewer system. Yeah, I mean, I think the, these these key policy areas. I think we can easily package these up and and distribute them. Yeah. Yeah, we're actually talking about having like a, a service connection care packet when we start a new customer. Right. Having it be part of our our, our account establishment and doing mm -hmm. a lot more outreach on it. That's okay. a great point. Uh, Commissioner West. I I just I'll just. And, and to be, like I said, like this is not a topic I know anything about. Um, I, I don't know how to do my own plumbing. I don't even change my own oil. Like this is not my wheelhouse. Uh, but um, I, I'm uneasy because it just seems like such a dramatic change from what the previous standards were. And the last thing that we want to deal with is a bunch of homes in Clackamas County that are backed up. And maybe it's my ignorance, me not knowing, maybe I need to talk offline with you guys. I do feel kind of uneasy about the uh, what seems like a pretty large shift from where we were. Um, I also, does like a, like structural, like speaking to the chair's question, um, so we're on the line for you said structural, but sometimes we can't handle if like look a, a root grows through. I'm guessing that happens too, or tree roots or whatever. Is that still a structural issue, or is the homeowner on the hook for that type of thing? Like, what's the difference between the ground settling and misalignment and just things that we can't control? What are we on the hook for? Roots are a good example. You know, root intrusion into a line is not a structural defect. That's an O and M issue. They need to be cleared out. Sometimes root intrusion is so bad that it breaks the pipe. Okay. So, you know, there, there, we do have a definition of structural defects. It is the district's re, uh, responsibility to determine whether it's a structural defect or not and whether to participate or not. Um, it, is, it is, again, it's, it's not so much, it's, it's more of a shift in what's written down as opposed to practice. This was not very clear what the responsibilities were in the rules that we've been using for decades. Um, we are clarifying what the district's responsibility is relative to the building owner and the service connection, and it should reduce our, our liability. I'm not clear to the risk to the homeowner, though, that now has a half a grade instead of, a, instead of the one grade, right? Like we went from... One to point five. I, I don't. I'm not. I'm not clear on the risk to the average Joe out there. If it was my house, and I just, you know, I bought it or moved into it and didn't realize that maybe the, we cha we loosened the rest the requirements. I don't understand the risk yet. So that's what that's where I'm getting a little hang up. I don't. I just don't. Something spidey sense maybe, and it could be totally off. Um, but. Uh, it could be cold medicine. I don't know. But, <laughs> but, but I don't know. Maybe offline there's a discussion that you guys can hold, give me a little education. Yeah, I just to do that. just telling you where I'm at. Sure. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, do you want to answer that? No, there's nothing to answer. Uh, Commissioner Schrader. 
Yeah, how often does this backup happen? It's evident, I mean, I'm not, I don't know if you have any data on that, but anecdotally, it doesn't seem as if it's, 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 it's kind very, of, it's very rare. It's rare. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. we have we have root intrusion into our lines pretty routinely, especially like up in Hoodland, um, and we have tools and things that that we use for our lines. Um, and then the homeowners are responsible generally for root intrusion on on the property. Right. I did have a neighbor that had to have a tree removed because it was intruding on his line, and that was his responsibility working with the local sewer system there. Mm -hmm. So really what you're just doing is clarifying yep. what's there so everybody is, is everybody knows who's on first mm -hmm. kind of an issue. I guess the other question I have, you, if I recall, you have an extensive education program because I get it all the time dealing with what not to put in toilets, what not to put in you know, yes. you, grease in your sinks and all of that kind of uh, issues that people will do. So um, I don't know what else you can do. Uh, you, you have an education program that if people don't know, I'd be wondering what <clears throat> what are they reading because you've yep. gotten it all out there. So Yeah, and I would also add that, you know, historically, you know, infrastructure was put in without – um, maybe before our rules were mm -hmm. put in, or maybe it wasn't inspected. Um, and we do have flat lines out in our system, and we know where they are. We have a, what we call a flusher route, um, where we go around and we flush those lines on a regular basis because we know they back up. Um, so we know we know how the system performs, and, and we know, um, and we're comfortable with modifying uh, that slope requirement based on engineering criteria and the amount of flow that would be going through those lines because we know the ones that are problematic okay. um, and we're comfortable with the proposal. And so uh, based on your engineering experience, this is, this is doable and mm -hmm. in your estimation is not going to cause any dramatic change in terms of people having backup issues. Absolutely. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Savas. Yeah, so I, I'd be remiss if I really didn't share some, some <coughs> experiences talking to people that do this for a living on the private sector when they're out there trying to fix something for a homeowner. And sometimes they feel very sorry for the homeowner, right, because the problem is exacerbated by something in the main line uh, or the way the home was built or the, the grades, which we're talking about here, the, the slope. Um, and so while Commissioner Schrader's question that you know, this is, doesn't happen that often, essentially. Um, there are a lot of things that are never really, are never ever bubble to the top. But you, you have a homeowner that's constantly dealing with something. They don't, it doesn't make it to us. It doesn't make it to you even often, right? But these people know where they are, right? They know they're experiencing problems. And so they're more frequent than, than we're aware of. But when you talk to the people in the industry, they see it all the time. They have camera systems like we do, right? They camera those lines. They see what's going on. They, hey, man, you know, this, 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 you need to fix your line out there. It's X, X, right? So I just want to just let everyone know that, you know, though we may not bubble up to our level, the problems are out there. Um, and I, so I think I like to err on the side of, of um, you know, good engineering. And anyone who owns a property will tell you that that knows this, will say, you want as much slope as you can ever get. You don't want less. You always want more. There's no advantage to the homeowner to having less slope, unless you want to make an argument that there is. No, and again, these, uh, the, the, our, our, our design standards for service connections are different from our design standards for main lines. And, and the slope change, the, the, the proposal to to modify the standard on slope is for main lines, not for service connections. So that's okay, staying so the same as it's always been. This is more just about ownership and O&M and repair. Yep. Okay. With, with the soils we have out here, and you know, we're not Eastern Oregon, and, and, but with the soils and the water that we get, you know, it's a bigger issue for us than it is in drier climates, about the pipe settling and those kinds of things. Yep. I agree. So I just want to put that out there as well. Yep, thank you. Uh, please continue. Okay, uh, we're going to switch gears and go to stormwater management. I am behind. I apologize for that. Right. Um, You're behind me because we asked you questions. Oh, that's so. Continue your presentation, please. Okay. Thank you. Um, so we have we have one slide that actually has several uh, changes to standards embodied in it, and that's to how we manage stormwater management. Um, I, I'll, I'll say that that uh, that 
this is largely aligning with our municipal stormwater permit requirements, the permit that we get from the Oregon Department of Environmental Quality, that is um, their authority under the Federal Clean Water Act to issue a permit to us to discharge stormwater from developed sites. And so we are aligning to what we need to do in that permit. We are issued a new permit in 2021. Um, and that had some more specific requirements and performance standards for on-site stormwater management, but still gives us some, some leeway in terms of what we adopt that's right for our communities. There's three legs to the stool right now on how we manage stormwater. If you are putting down new impervious area, collecting and conveying and discharging stormwater, you have to do three things. The first is you have to try and keep as much stormwater on-site as you can. We have an infiltration requirement that we've had for well over 10 years that says you have to keep the first half inch of rain that falls on your site. What then runs off your site, you have to treat, meaning you have to remove pollutants from. That's the Clean Water Act piece. And then what also runs off your site, you have to control those flows for flooding as well as for stream health. That's what our, per our permit says we have to do that. One of the challenges, and we heard this um, loud and clear during our listening, uh, is that that, info, that, first, that first leg of the stool, the infiltration requirement is challenging in a lot of different areas. Um, where people can put water into the ground or retain it on site, they will, they do, it's cheaper for them. But in areas in Happy Valley is a good example, hilly, difficult soils, high, high groundwater, you can't always get water to go into the ground. And so we, we find, we find uh, that that's really difficult to implement and, and people say it's very challenging to, to try and meet that requirement. Um, so in, in this, in the, the policy changes for us to not require infiltration, but, but clearly say that infiltration is a preferred strategy to stormwater management and that if you, if you can infiltrate your water quality storm or your, or your required flow control storm, then you're done. Getting as much water in the ground is still the preferred approach to those that can do it, and they will. What that leaves is water that runs off the site that I said before has to first be treated. We have a goal in our standards now for 80% removal of total suspended solids, meaning when somebody designs a stormwater management facility to remove pollutants from stormwater, it needs to be able to achieve that performance. Our permit now says that that's a requirement, it's not a goal. So we are, we are incorporating that into our standards to say you, it has to, it's not preferred, it's a, it's not a, it's not a should, it's a shall now. Um, and, and I think that that's industry standard, people expect that. Um, so that hasn't been too much of an issue that we've talked about with folks. The third piece is managing flow. Um, because we're not requiring people to hold more water on site, right now our approach is, is, is called a peak matching approach, it reduces the, the highest flows that come off a site after it's developed, and we require people to reduce those peaks down to a certain level. It's been industry standard for decades. It's mainly around flooding. The goal of that peak matching approach is to reduce downstream issues and flooding, but it does cause issues for streams. It, it allows more, it allows flows for longer periods of time because you're, you're, you're reducing those peak flows. It allows them to, to to be discharged for longer periods of time and that's very erosive to streams. And so now our permit requires us to look at the amount of water, not just the rate, but the amount, the volume, and the duration of higher flows. We have actually had um, this approach, this, this flow duration matching approach for quite a while in, in sort of the background. We developed a, an approach <coughs> almost 10 years ago that was never adopted that, um, that would, that would meet the goals of what is now required of us in our permit. Oregon City and Wilsonville both adopted the, those standards back in like 2015 and have been uh, successfully implementing them. What we're now proposing to do is to bring this flow duration matching approach into our standards, make it a requirement. We think it complies with our municipal stormwater permit. We still need to get DEQ to agree with that sometime in the next couple of years. Um, the alternative that DEQ gave to us, I'll just add in the permit, is to keep an inch of stormwater on site. We're struggling to get, due to a lot of the parts of our district that, that because of, again, geology, soils, groundwater, we can't, we can't get half an inch of water to go, uh, to, to go into the ground. We're certainly not gonna be able to keep an inch of water on the ground. This flow duration matching approach is, is an alternative approach that DEQ will approve. 
So we're proposing it now in this update. Um, in, situa in situations where people can't infiltrate stormwater into the ground, we allow them to use this flow duration matching approach now through a variance process and they do it. Um, and that's mostly what's happening in Happy Valley and has been happening for years as, as a way for them to be able to move through the process. So from a development community perspective, you know, they, they certainly understand our need to, to meet our municipal stormwater permit. They're used to doing this. They're used to doing it in Oregon City and Wilsonville as well. Um, and so they, you, we haven't really gotten much pushback at all. It's possible that on certain sites that this could result in larger stormwater management ponds, particularly if they're challenged to get water to infiltrate into the ground, ponds will get bigger. Um, that's some sites, not all sites, and that is certainly one of the, the potential outcomes that we wanna flag for you. Um, but like I said, I think people understand that and, and are supportive of this proposal. Continue. Are you done? Yeah, I'm done on the stormwater management piece. Okay, continue with the rest of your presentation. So that's questions. These are the topics we wanted to propose. Um, happy to answer more questions about any of these three. I will say that our, our ask is, is we, we think we're ready to, to take the rules and regulations and standards to public hearing for ordinance adoption and see what the public thinks uh, with your approval. We'll do that. We have dates set on the calendar um, that we would notice the hearings and schedule them and, and, and bring them to you officially for adoption if that is your direction. Okay. Commissioner Savas? Yeah. <clears throat> I don't have a question, uh, but I certainly will be talking um, and see how some of these impact the, the road, people who build roads for a living and our road department, the roads we own. Um, when it comes to storm water, you know, there's always been the engineering standard that you, you want to skirt the water far away from the roadbed as you can mm -hmm. so you, the road doesn't get hydraulic and, and be eroded away. And now we're, now we're putting more water in the ground and with some of the roadside, what they call it, gardens, is that what they called? Planters. Planters. The roadside planters is, you know, counterintuitive to really a lot of the, the engineering world that builds roads. Um, so where I've seen that done, there's a particular area on, on 99E that since they've done that, um, every time ODOT is constantly repairing that, that road, roadway is going away constantly. They, they're out there, they fix it, and within a year, that roadway is already starting to cave in and there's potholes. So it's clear that it doesn't work everywhere, but I sometimes I think regulations and policies don't recognize the consequences of this. So it's one engineering world versus another, but I would love to talk to some some of our road people and others to see how these new regulations might hurt or help the problem. Yeah. You, know what I'm you know what I'm talking about, right? I do, I, yeah. I do, and uh, we, we, DTD was part of our, our technical task force and we've had conversations with them in Happy Valley about the construction of roads. The, the approach that we're proposing, which is a treat and flow control ap approach, doesn't require infiltration where it doesn't make sense. And so, you know, this, 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 this allows a path forward that avoids some of those structural issues, but I totally get what you're talking about. Yep. And it's expensive as heck. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, it is expensive. Have you finished? Yes. Thanks, Commissioner Joe. Schrader? Yeah, I just want to say, I think as, as I look at this, and as, again, I'll, I'll be like um, Commissioner West, I, this isn't, I'm not an engineer, okay, but I have been following this enough where I think I'm reasonably reasonably confident, and uh, I know that Commissioner Savas has years of uh, experience uh, in this arena, so, but as I think this through as a policy, what this really is is risk reduction. Mm -hmm. It's never fully going to stop a backflow somewhere or a problem of one kind. The issue is, given what we're faced with technically, you really want to re reduce the occurrences of that. And what I'm hearing from you folks is that these processes, your technical uh, um, expertise really will reduce, that you're not going to do anything that's going to increase larger risk, but no matter what, something's going to happen. And that's just the way of structures. <laughs> you know, structures fail, but you do everything you can to make sure they're not failing and that you're reducing risk. Is that an accurate? That, that's exactly right. I mean, we're just trying to get better. Yeah. Uh, we, we, we see the, the issues that are out there. Um, 
and look at our rules and say, how can we make it better? I mean, it's not going to be, nothing is perfect. It, and there will be instances where things um, go wrong. But we think that we're um, you know, making a, a marked improvement in both the clarity and the, quant the quality of our rules and regs. Thank you. Gary, how do we give permission that they can continue on the public hearings? If you would accept option one in your staff report, which just says that, you will approve moving forward to a public hearing. I'll entertain a motion. Yeah. I, move, right the... I move we approve key policy proposals as presented in part two for the adoption at the future public hearing. I'll, I'll second. Commissioner Scholl has moved we approve the future policy decisions for a public hearing regarding the West uh, plan. Commissioner West has second that motion. Any further discussions? Uh, Chair, I'll, I'll support this today, <clears throat> but I, I will have some conversations. Uh, I think just to add on the conversation we just he, just had with mm -hmm. Commissioner Strader and, and uh, Mr. Geist, um, some of the regulations are, you know, it's it's the yin and the yang. Uh, uh, we're, for water quality, we're maybe compromising road stability and long-term maintenance and so forth. So it's there's there's give and takes. Mm -hmm. Um, but there's also the permit regulations as well that we're, and we haven't even talked about, my, I'm sure that Ben and others may not be aware of the significance of the Nipodes permit and the MS4 permit. So at one time, they, that might be a good idea to brief them on what that means mm -hmm. and where we're headed. Happy yeah. to do that. Yeah. Thank, Thank you very much, and, Commissioner and Schrader. I'd like to join you with that too, so because I do respect your technical expertise because of all the years you've been doing it. So when we, we have these conversations, let me know. And I'll be of help, I hope. Okay. Commissioner West. I'm done. Right. Um, uh, yeah, I'm happy to support this too. I just feel like I need a stronger baseline on what I'm looking at. Um, you can't be an expert in everything, right? So uh, I defer to your expertise um, and some of my more experienced commissioners. That's why there's five of us. We all we all bring different things to the table. As I've said, this is not um, much, much of anything. I, I, I mean, I know I... I mean, I just know as much as probably any layman off the street that's not in this industry. So I would look forward to some additional um, education to learn how to be a, a better commissioner on this issue. Thank you, Commissioner West. Seeing no further discussion, Tony, please take the poll. Commissioner Schrader. Aye. Commissioner Savas. Aye. Commissioner West. Aye. Commissioner Scholl. Aye. Chair Smith. Aye. Motion passes 5-0. Thank you very much for coming forward. Thank you so much. Great. Uh, Chair Smith, would you now reconvene as the Board of County Commissioners? I will recess as the Water Environment Services and convene as the Board of County Commissioners. Uh, your next policy session as the board, sitting as the Board of County Commissioners is the Metro Urban Growth, Urban Growth Boundary Exchange. Commissioners, you had asked to speak more about this. Uh, we have as presenters uh, Stephen Madcor, County Council. And, and myself and other staff are present as well to answer your questions and have a discussion with you. It looks like Nate Boderman's also joining from County Council. <clears throat> Go ahead, please, to tee it up, Stephen. Thank you, Gary. Morning, Commissioners. Good to see you, Nate. So this is a revisit of the Metro UGB. Um, they called it a land exchange. It's really a transfer of about 500 acres from Clackamas County in the area formerly known as Damascus, as well as areas outside of uh, Oregon City, transferring that to the city of Tiger to expand their urban growth boundary to allow for a project called River Terrace 2.0, which was going to be for middle housing. The process is authorized in the OARs, Oregon Administrative Rules, and also cross-references boundary, UGB boundary expansion in the ORS, Oregon Revised Statutes. It's a process that has not been done before. So this was the first time. And it is of, uh, they had three different options of properties that they looked at and the Metro Council decided on this particular one. Like I said, two different pieces of property in Clackamas County that were transferred to um, the city of Tigard, expanding their urban growth boundary. It now is at the Department of Land Conservation and Development where our office submitted objections to that, that process, identifying defects of sorts in the process itself, in outreach, in um, cooperation with jurisdictions such as Clackamas County, and also we had asked for a delay to allow for 
the semiconductor analysis is what it was, or? Not, not as part of the objection, but I think that was made a part of the record in some form. Right. We also asked for um, other things that were really unrelated to the transfer itself, which was uh, prioritize funding for needed transportation investments, support the retention of Sunrise Corridor on the constrained RTP list, support Sun Sunrise Corridor community visioning project, and champion the preferred transportation alternative to ensure funding and implementation. Arguably, those areas, those ask, weren't necessarily related to the exchange itself, but the two components of the exchange that required kind of like county involvement one was the presentation to the county itself, and number two was that the underlying zoning had to be, the, the, the land removed had to be designated a particular zoning designation. In our situation, it reverted to county rural zoning, so that wasn't necessarily anything that needed to be done by us because it was there as a matter of law. They removed it, and county zoning still applied to that particular property. Is it RRFF5 on that one, you think, or...? Uh, that sounds, I mean, it's not a, it's not a county rural resource zone. So yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's not a what? It's, it's not the rural resource zone that's, uh, uh, regulated directly by the state. And so it, it goes into that th there was no zone change that was necessary. It was an exception. It, we're, we're getting very deep into planning speak, but it's, yep. it, it's not subject to the restriction that would have required the county to adopt a separate zoning classification. That's what it comes down to. Correct. So essentially, as a matter of default, it reverted to that. It was our understanding that the property owners who own this land out in the area, formerly known as Damascus, did not object to the withdrawal or supported it. Hard to say. Metro said that they supported it. We never really talked to those folks, but that is what the record reflects. So the matter is currently at the state now where the state would likely approve it. And after that, the county would have an opportunity to challenge that to Luba. Is that right, Nate? Uh, it goes to Court of Appeals. Court of Appeals. Uh, but the first step in the process is for the DLCD director to uh, weigh in on our objection. And so we're waiting to hear back from the department on their response to our objection. And really, that's, I think, all we have to offer on this, unless Nate has any additional comments. Happy to answer any questions that the commissioners uh, might have. Again, it's a process that hasn't been used before. process was... Um, new to us and new to Metro. And I do think that um, the, the uh, objections that the county expressed were more process oriented than actually operational. That those 500 acres, although no longer in the county's urban growth boundary, if we had plans for something, we would likewise be in a situation where we could ask for Metro to employ the same process that they used here to benefit Clackamas County, should we have a project that was at the level that this River Terrace project was in, in Tigard, which was years in the making, apparently. Okay. Nate, is this your last presentation before the board? No, you're you're stuck with me for about another month or so. So okay. we've got plenty of business to wrap up before okay. that time. Well, don't be a stranger. Um, my light board is alive, and we will start with Commissioner Savas. Yeah, well, congratulations uh, on your new position. I hate to lose you. Thank I you. really appreciated your ability. I mean, your your presentation skills and all that. So you've always made the very complicated things much easier for me to understand as a layman. So I appreciate that. Thank you for that. Um, I don't know where to begin, Chair, but I'm going to kind of break it Go open ahead. a little bit. I'm, gonna, just, I'm just going to break it open a little bit. So Go ahead. Um, first of all, out of the gate, I just want to say, I don't think, I, don't, I have not heard anyone on this board at all um, who wants to impede the effort of development in Tigard. Um, I have not heard anyone on this board that wants to impede the development of more housing in the region. So I think this board has been consistent in, uh, on that. So to those out there that have any doubt about that, um, that that's, that's not our goal here. Um, what upset me a little bit initially in this process, Metro's process was, is that you're right, they've never done this before this way. That was a surprise. But when they came out of the gate and said that, geez, because you know lack of preparedness, um, infrastructure, so on, you know, therefore you're not prepared, so we're gonna, you know, we're gonna take that land out. 
and as much work as we tried to get the land in, um, uh, that hurts. But the most significant part of that is that Metro has not helped us be prepared from an infrastructure standpoint, for example. Um, they haven't helped us advocate for, as a matter of fact, they've, you know, openly at times, certain members of, of Metro staff or the council over the years and recent have said, oh, you can't, you know, it's not worth it, it's too expensive, uh, or they don't want it, or it's not needed, um, so on and so forth. So they have not helped us um, financially or policy-wise at times, and frankly, sometimes have actually gone to the legislature and, and um, you know, try to steer those resources other ways in other areas. And here we are again, steering at least the land resource um, away where, uh, out, out of the Clackamas County. I am concerned also that this will be, um, you know, attempted again and again. I think, and it will just, we're not gonna see the, the uh, uh, any kind of uh, being made whole or any kind of recovery until I see actual support and dollars and votes that result in infrastructure, I'm not confident about, about their political willingness to help us. Um, that, that, part, that, that part disturbs me quite a bit. So from a process standpoint, again, I'll just expand on that. I really thought this was, this was in my opinion, my experience, poorly done. Um, uh, you know, they had their initial sites and then unbeknownst to, well, obviously it was public, but very late in the game, those sites changed and the land being studied changed. And some of the area, the area in Oregon City, for example, it is very close to the urban areas, very close to urbanization and a concentration of, of urbanization. So it does not really, frankly, make sense today. But um, all that aside, I'm worried about the precedent setting. Uh, we have not, we've, we've asked them to help, help us make us whole here. Um, and that has not happened from Metro. So they did what they've done. Um, and I'm hoping we can find a remedy. The other th last thing about this, or big point I want to make here, is that um, you know we're in this housing emergency. We had a housing crisis before this. We had a, we had a housing crisis um, acknowledged before with the last governor and the current governor. And respectfully, I think the governor, um, you know, has a number one issue is housing. Um, we and I feel in part that the urban growth boundary and some of our land use regulations are actually impeding and increasing the cost of building housing and, and affordability, which I think has exacerbated the homeless crisis for people being economically displaced. So it seems if ever there's a time, and I've said this before, I'll say it again, if there's ever a time for Metro or the state or the governor to come in and say, you know what, um, you know, here Tiger, here's your land, go ahead and do it, and leave Clackamas County whole. We, they don't have to take it out. There's a way, there's a workaround. And that I, you know, and I understand the regulations and all the other stuff we work in, but if there's ever a time to <coughs> waive those, the governor's got the power. And if not, if she asks for the power, if she feels she certainly doesn't have it, she certainly has the legislature on her side and she has me on her side for asking for that power to say, you know, that we, we should expand the urban growth boundary um, and not go through a delayed process that cost everyone money, including the developers and people that want to move their project in Tigard, as well as those who want to move it in Clackamas County along the Sunrise Corridor um, and give us the, the resources to build the infrastructure. So there's ever a time for us to come together to expand the urban growth boundary and make not just Clackamas County whole, but help stimulate that growth here as well so that people don't have to drive just to Washington County uh, to get a job every day. Uh, it's, it's complex. I, I'll stop there, Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Savas. I've made some notes on your comments. I appreciate them. We'll listen to the um, other commissioners. <clears throat> to your point, <clears throat> the legislature did give the governor authority to supersite the microchips investments. So they do have the will to do it. Um, it's just a matter of them paying attention. Commissioner Scholl, you're up. Yes, thank you. We have a little control over what decision the DLCD makes. But next year, in 2024, is the UGB expansion planning cycle. And we need to make sure that Clackamas County receives significant recognition uh, for our needs for development and the inclusion of at least 500 acres 
uh, moved into the UGB with acknowledgement uh, to of our need for Metro help in system development. So, yes, this this land exchange didn't work well for us, but now we need to concentrate on what we can do to prepare for that 2024 UGB expansion cycle. We need to be ready. We need to have ideas, uh, and we need to push those ideas for development for this county. So we don't have much time. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Schrader. Um, yeah, I, my concern is, um, because I, I did get a call from the developer, the folks that are doing the housing in the Tigard area, and they expressed their concern to me that this would probably, I just wanted to get an answer from you folks, slow down the process of building that middle income housing. Do we have any idea what this is going to do uh, if we proceed with an LCDC, which it uh, looks like we're going there? How's that going to uh, affect, how's that going to affect a timeline for needed housing in, in the area? Yeah, it would affect the effective date uh, or the implementation of that urban growth boundary adjustment. And so that's the challenge. That's the effect of the challenge right. is to, um, I mean, we are challenging the effectiveness of Metro's order. Uh, and so to the extent that they're waiting on that to be final, then I would say yes, it would affect and delay that. Um, as far as the timelines, uh, I'd have to go back and look, but okay. it's a fairly expedited timeline in terms of uh, the DLC director's response and then uh, land use hearings at the Court of Appeals are typically uh, expedited processes in and of themselves. So I guess I just wanted to find out indeed if it was expedited because um, I certainly don't care for how Metro is handling this, so I'm not going to defend uh, how this has been pushed forward at all. However, I am concerned that, uh, that we do need the housing. So the fact that I'm hearing from you that it will move relatively quickly. I just, well, you know, as, as these processes it's a, it's go. It's expedited is a somewhat self-defining term, right? And so, I mean, we've, we've had expedited land use hearings at the Court of Appeals, you know, I mean, the urban reserves, this isn't as complex as that, but that was a year plus, and that was uh, purportedly an expedited hearing as well. And so it's, it's still up to the court uh, to to you know, take its time to make sure it has the ability to make its decision. But uh, what I can tell you is under the rules, it is supposed to be a, what they characterize as an expedited proceeding. Yeah, the other thing is why are we incorporating, I'm not asking you, but maybe someone on our board can tell me, urban growth boundary for the Oregon Semiconductor Competitive Task Force because doesn't the governor have supersiding ability? Okay, that was my idea and the governor did not have supersiding ability before what I had asked that's very old. <clears throat> what I had asked is, don't mess with our urban growth boundary until the legislature <coughs> can make a decision. However, the legislature really has not made a decision. <clears throat> the only thing they've done is punt their authority to the governor for very specific <clears throat> use. That's okay. what that's about. I know, but so doesn't the authority lie with her anyway? Do we have to mention that in this document? I mean, yes, we do have to mention that. I believe. I believe it's a factor very much. Okay. Yes. So um, I don't necessarily think so, but that's all right. We can. Well, you disagree. can disagree. That's fine. That's okay. Continue, yeah. Commissioner Schrader. Um. Okay. How is our relationship in terms of really moving anything forward with Metro at this point? At, at all, are we talking to anybody, colleagues? Are we are we pushing back with Commissioner, not Commissioner, but um, President Peterson? I mean, what's been what's the we've been going to MPAC and JPAC. Right? So what's the pushback been? And we're just not getting a response from them, correct? Well, I can tell you a couple of conversations I've had, but Paul, go ahead. Yeah, I've no, on, I just I'm not on MPAC, so I haven't heard anything. Okay, I'm not either, but. Mark, are you on impact? What are you yes, hearing? Yes. Uh, no, I have not heard anything on, on this. Okay. Okay. So what have you heard, Chair? Well, uh, Christine Lewis is in my office in January. She said, oh, we're going to go ahead and do what we want to do. It's going to piss you off too bad. Goodbye. Oh, okay. Okay. And I said, look, this is not an exchange. It's a taking. 
you know, you really need to reach out. And I have several questions about what's been presented in here, and I can continue on this after the other commissioners have made comments. Uh, Martha? No, I'm done. That's okay. I just Mr. wondered West? what that was. Can, um, can you just walk me through really quickly, like, it looks like we've our first step to object, am I, please correct me if I'm wrong, I just want to understand it. Our first step to objection, which I think this board clearly does, um, is we're setting forth these letters to challenge process. We're not, it's not an issue with Tiger. Tiger is in a different county and is a different situation altogether, but we're focusing on our needs here in Clackamas and our focus right now, even though it may slow up the process for the housing, is to challenge it first step on process. Is that correct? It is. I guess I would say that the effect of the challenge, uh, if successful, would be to uh, reverse Metro's order and the urban growth boundary adjustment. And, 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 so, and so that possibly could happen if they agree with us on process. Uh, correct, if, if they find that we're correct on the objections. So what happens next if we are not successful with these initial letters and, and complaints? Uh, presumably we'd have an opportunity to appeal to the Court of Appeals. Okay. Um, basically reinstating our objections and then the court takes it from there. Okay, so this is just the initial stages of us kind of um, taking on this issue. Correct. Okay, um, I, I mean just, I can't help but notice as this board looks to try to be really innovative and smart even with the land we have within the UGB to um, create new and innovative solutions regarding houses as homelessness and other issues all of that land that we had to us could potentially used within the UGB f to help support those services and build infrastructure in the future for being visionary. And the moment you take those lots away from us, now we have less usable land within the UGB for Clackamas County's purposes, either for housing or, or for some other factor that we think would be important. Um, and so uh, I, I do see us having a loss. Um, it, it's an all too familiar narrative I, I fully agree with um, Commissioner Savas' assessment on the situation. Uh, when I was, I don't know, my first week or two on the job here, we went and had that evening meeting with Metro where they laid it out for us. And, mm -hmm. you know, it was, it was basically for the community, except nobody in the community came and it wasn't anywhere near the community that was effective. And it was, yeah, it was functionally ridiculous. And, um, and, and it just a waste of, like, a bunch of bureaucrats bloviating to Paul and I for over an hour about how this was good for us. Um, and it, we were just basically almost, almost a sense of being bullied. Like, you know, this is how it is and you know, tough luck. Um, and so I just, at a certain point, man, I, 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 I feel for the developer. Um, I want more housing, but I'm not willing to kind of, uh, just be told tough luck anymore. Um, that's the sentiment that a lot of us have gotten. So I, I thank you for this initial step. I think it's smart and thoughtful. Um, and I hope that this board continues to fight this as long as we have to. Thank you for that. I have some questions and some statements. Metro has defined this as an exchange. Can you define me for me the word exchange? I define this as a taking because an exchange is I give you something and then you give me something back. What have we received back from Metro? I called it more of a transfer because it's transferring 490 acres of land within the urban growth boundary within Clackamas to the city of Tigard. So okay, I agree with your terminology. That's the number one thing if we decide to do this. This is not an exchange. It is a taking, and in these two letters signed by me, we have been asked to be made whole. Metro has not reached out to me or anybody that I know in that process, okay? Um, I've made some notes. Um, in, in your memo on page two, Clackamas County has no record of having received notice from Metro with respect to the adoption of Ordinance 32-1488. But Stephen, in your memo, you said, is it yesterday we finally got uh, something from them, is that right? 
That is correct. There's a time time limitations on when you can file objections with DLCD, and it's uh, the clock starts ticking when you get notice. And we never got the formal notice from Metro that we can find with your offices and with uh, DTD offices or our offices. So, only when. Thank oh, you. Yeah. So even if we agreed with this decision and we don't, if Metro failed to give the notice, the landowner can't even get busy building out there, correct? I, the consequences, yes. I mean, it would be a procedural defect. Okay, yeah. Another procedural defect that, thank you for pointing that out. Uh, demonstrate the, that the objecting party participated orally or in writing. Uh, we have made... Um, letters to them. However, they have not reached out to us, for instance, in a board meeting. Lynn Peterson came here. I says we need to make, be made whole. They have ignored us. The only uh, offer that I have heard from Metro is they want to do some planning for us, commissioners. Yeah. I don't know how much money that involves. I don't know if it's going to be yet again another dictatorship where we're not offered to submit what we want, commissioners. That offer has been made. Are we going to sit down? And I tell them, I have not brought that before the Board of Commissioners yet. I will neither say yay or nay to that. I have no idea uh, what they plan for us. But if their past history is any record of uh, engaging in local jurisdictions such as ours, I don't have a lot of hope for that. So if we file what is, I think, presented in your memo today, Nate, how soon will DLCD consider this? Again, I need to check the administrative rules, but I, my recollection is it's 30 or 60 days, something okay. along those okay. lines. Yeah. So if we filed this, this is automatically halt the construction of the 500 residences or homes or whatever they're building. Well, I, to, to be clear, it has been filed. And it has been filed. It, it has been filed, okay. and so the, the the clock is ticking for the DLCD director to to. Uh, and when was that filed again, a response. Nate? And when um, was that filed again? March fifteenth. March fifteenth. Thank you very much for that. <clears throat> but to answer your question more directly, I mean that depending on the DLC director's response, they will either accept the objection or reject it. Then that will determine if it goes to court of appeals or if we have further process with DLCD. But uh, nothing is final until we resolve the, the, the appeal here. I think we have no other choice but to take this action. As commissioners have said, this is unprecedented in nature. They have not reached out to us. They have not tried to make us whole. A few hundred thousand dollars thrown at Clackamas County for planning isn't going to cut it, especially if they're dictating where and how and when we can plan. It's not going to work. Uh, we have several commissioners in the queue. I believe Commissioner Savas, you're up next. Yeah, so, so as I understand it, I'm just, I'm just summarizing and wave your hand if, I'm, if I say something incorrect. So as I understand it, we set our letter of objection the, if the DL, LCDC director, DLCD director rejects it, then we can appeal it. Um, uh, so I think keeping the pressure on, hopefully, ideally, will lead to a legislative global solution, whether it's all of the above. So I think, that, to me, I see that as the end game. Um, you know, hopefully they'll, they'll step in with a solution that makes Clackamas County whole. Um, so let's just talk about the impacts uh, of why this is a bigger deal, and I think we need to share this with our state legislators. Um, okay, we, you can, we can bring that land back in. So if someone wants to develop some of the land that is potentially taken out, that's a long, expensive process. It's much harder to take it, bring it back in than it is with this process of taking it out. And um, that cost and delay will cost everyone money, and that whatever they build is going to cost more money because those costs get passed on to the to the property, to the property owners, or the purchasers, or the land, or the developers, all of the above. So um, you know, in a sense, I kind of sense that we are at a um, this this burden is passed on to us, and there's no way out. As I understand, the planning dollars, the CET dollars offered by Metro is you know, a smidgen of something tied to whether or not a city wants to sponsor a development, and we don't have any control over that. So while all of this is not, you know, to be honest, not all of this is Metro's fault, I'm not talking about the process here for the land exchange, but, you know, the process of developing land and, and all the regulations we live in, uh, the cities play a strong role in whether or not they um, advocate or help develop a property or not. 
uh, to bring it in or develop whether it's already in or whatnot. So I understand that. That said, um, you know, um, we're, we're at least right now with this, we're at an impasse. We'll see what happens. Um, they haven't offered us a solution. Uh, again, I just want to just state that we're looking for a global solution from the state legislator to jump in, and maybe there's a way through all the processes and all the efforts that we are made whole somehow. Um, and that's, what, that's how I see it. Sure, thank, that's all I have. Thank you very much on this. Uh, Commissioner Scholl. Yes, I just want to clarify my, clarify my previous comment. Um, MPAC has, in fact, had briefings from Metro on this UGB land exchange, uh, uh, but no specific uh, discussion about how the loss of this 500 acres from Clackamas County would be remedied. You know, they um, have no, no, no idea. Yeah, so again, like I said before, it's incumbent upon us to come up with uh, a solution and be ready for that 2024 UGB expansion planning cycle. That's where we need to really make some progress. Do you trust that planning cycle, Commissioner Scholl? Well, Chair Smith, I don't know if I can say I trust it completely, but I do know that if we don't go in there with guns blazing to stick up for the needs of this county, we probably won't get any help from them. And I kind of think this procedure we could about um, entered into today is one of those opportunities for to get their attention. Yeah, I agree. Okay. Yeah, and I, I'm not willing to wait for the next year's planning cycle. It's going to take forever, and we're still sitting in limbo. Commissioner Schrader? Yeah, I'm fine moving ahead with this letter with the caveat that uh, our pugnacious attitude does not seem to be getting us anywhere, either with Metro or our legislators at this point. What legislators are down there that are helping us with this at this point, do we know? That's probably more of a PGA question, right? Public and government affairs, so maybe I should just get in touch with them. Um, you know, all of how we work with this, these kinds of issues is relational, and sometimes we gotta we gotta step back and try and repair relationships. I think we're at the point now where that isn't going to be possible, however. So I have signed this letter, I'll stand by this letter, but I do think we have to have a conversation of how we manage our conflicts with uh, colleagues in the region. So that's probably for our planning session, so. Uh, I'd just like to remind folks, this decision is almost three months old. Mm -hmm. And despite our efforts to engage, that Metro has not reached out to seriously have a conversation with me and maybe the other commissioners to try to uh, listen to our concerns and even ask us what we want. And I think that is just a horrid way, horrid, horrid way to manage government. Um, and it affects so many hundreds of thousands of people, not just in Clackamas County, but in the region as well. Commissioner West? Um, I, since we were talking about what type of interaction Metro's had with us, um, in January, uh, Council President Lynn Peterson had multiple conversations with me about, well, why don't we talk about planning dollars for mm -hmm. 212 and 224? Um, and conversations around how they, you know, um, can help us get going on that effort. So that's the yeah, yeah that's the carrot. Yes, yeah, yes. Okay. Um, and so, um, but for a number of reasons, why I still believe that that is not a sufficient or real solution. With as Chair Smith talked about, a lot of um, uh, hooks in that deal that may not be good along the way for Clackamas County either. Uh, also, um, somewhat maybe. Uh, inhibiting some local control on that very issue also. Uh, so there has been some type of conversations between individual commissioners, but that doesn't mean Metro has actually ever really done anything effective and sufficiently before this whole board through the process, right? Um, but, and I don't feel like, you know, trading a bowl of soup uh, for, for, the, for the county's birthright. Um, and what it's due. So I'm, I'm just not interested. Analogy, Commissioner yeah. No okay. Esau's on this panel. Okay. That's a good one. Do you have a comment? Well, uh, Commissioner 
Wes just mentioned something that's a base problem that we've been facing for years, and that is the lack of autonomy in Clackamas County that removes our ability to forge ahead on the future that we see for our county. We have too much, uh, uh, too many restrictions from Metro, too many restrictions from the state government, too many restrictions from current state land use laws. And here we are today talking about a problem that was brought about by Metro. We need to get back to a time when a board in this county had the autonomy to make decisions in land use. And it seems like we're just, I'm not saying we're spinning our wheels, but the state's spinning, spinning their wheels. Uh, <clears throat> I'm not seeing a lot of change in the legislature for, mm -hmm. uh, or motivation for changing these restrictions. Well, yeah, and, and my conversations with the governor, she wants to add how many tens of thousands of um, housing units inside the urban growth boundary. And I says, Governor, in Clackamas County, that isn't possible. It's a huge land use issue, a huge land use issue that's affecting us, and I'm assuming other jurisdictions as well. And we heard recently from the city of Malala, who is number one, they're one of the fastest growing cities in the entire state of Oregon. They need a sewer expansion. They're desperately trying to find dollars so they don't have to tax their people out of oblivion. And they want to expand their urban growth boundary, which is going to take years because of more state laws that inhibit growth. So there's all these pressures that are coming. And you know, the people who make these decisions aren't listening. So I don't know how we get them to listen, except if we do this, we move forward. You know, housing anywhere helps housing everywhere. I understand that. But Metro, in their indecision, in their inability or their unwillingness to reach out to this board has put us in this position of having to appeal to a higher court in the land, pay attention to what we're saying. So Gary, how do we proceed on this? Yes, so what I'm uh, hearing, what I, rec what I recommend is let's wait for the LCDC for their decision and maybe staff, or Nate, you can follow up to see what a general timeline might be. Pending that decision, you can then decide if you wanna pursue legal action with the Court of Appeals, or if the decision is favorable to us, that's positive. We can do a f ask in the legislative session, which it might be too late because the bills are already done, but we can certainly see if it can be added to another bill, this current session, so we could pursue that work if you direct us to do so. And then if you would like, we can, staff can reach out, staff to staff to Metro to talk about gathering our boards to discuss this further, or, Whatever message you'd like me to give to Metro staff, I'm happy to do that. Okay, let's talk about um, this legislative session. So PGA came to this board. These are your legislative priorities, one, two. And there wasn't anything to do with uh, land use designations as far as I know, although this board has been sitting here saying it, saying it, saying it. Gary, at the direction of this board, I want you to direct Chris Lyons and that whole PGA staff to start scouring bills. I was in the legislature, I know how you do this, to scour every single bill with the correct, um, the correct um, opening language. What's that called? Relating clause. Excuse me, relating clause. And we start offering amendments to every single bill. That's the only way, commissioners, we're going to get anybody's attention. Going down there and talking to them and saying, gee, we have a problem with land use isn't working. And I don't even know if our team is talking about land use. Because I was down there all afternoon yesterday, and we were pretty much limited to a couple different discussions. So, uh, oh, by the way, the housing uh, emergency with the governor did come up on the restrictions for expansion of housing. So some of them are aware, but they're so time constrained. And, and like you say, the session is half over, but we still have an opportunity for amendments. Amendments can be presented at any time, even when they pass one session or one house to the other. So just because they pass the Senate moves to the House, we can still amend it in the House. If for another reason to get people to pay attention, because then, there are legislative meetings throughout the year that we can follow up on 
and continue in those efforts. I think that's the only way if we make a very concerted effort. Commissioners, do you agree with that strategy? I think it's a good idea. I think what happens, Chair Smith, down in the, in the legislature, uh, our representatives and senators are overwhelmed by a thousand or fifteen hundred yeah. bills. They get they get bogged down in the swamp, and the real problems that affect the counties go unnoticed. Okay, yeah. so I, I your idea right. your your idea to make a, a greater noise, I think, is a good step forward. Thank you, and um, we can discuss exactly what we want to say in these amendments. I'd reach out. County Council and they can help draft those I think Commissioner Savas uh, chair I, I think I understand and maybe I'm mistaken so but I just want to just put the, put it out there I think I understand what you're asking um, and so when you when you say Gary directs staff to comb through all that I, I am sure they'll find a bill with a relating clause that they that could be leveraged so I don't think that there's a need necessarily to do that I just want to just understand what and I think I would assume that staff would want to put together a proposal or a plan and bring it back to us for consideration, whether it's Tuesday or whatnot, to say what is going to be our strategy um, in the legislature and what is it we're asking for. And maybe we'll be talking about something like that this afternoon because that's part of our bigger picture. But I think we kind of, you know, and I wasn't 100 percent happy with the legislative, you know, uh, it wasn't about this per se, but but um, you know, I, I just don't want to unravel what we did direct and do something different without the clarity of understanding what it is. So maybe our staff can take our discussion today and suggest. Yes, that's what I'm hoping. Yeah, and, and bring something back for, so we can give direct, better, clear direction. But I want to I do the doable. <laughs> I don't want to spend a whole lot of time doing something that's going to get us nowhere. Yeah. But advocacy, and right now the legislature in session and this issue, it's hot. And maybe, maybe people will realize, Metro and others will realize, Let's let's all work together on a solution. Thank you, Commissioner Schrader. Yeah, I'm not adverse to that either, but I think that we have to come up with a plan. Okay, we can't continue to just do one-offs as we grapple with a lot of these really uh, meaty decisions. We really have to give clarity to staff about what we really want them to do, and this is another addition to things they're already doing. So we got to realize that and know that. Uh, that's okay, and uh, certainly I think it can be done. But let's be let's be uh, strategic about how we approach these things, please. Thank you. I think um, we have a consensus from the board, Gary, to move forward on the secondary strategy. Yes. Um, commissioners, um, we have another policy session coming up, and um, we are finished with this one. I'm going to take a five-minute recess, and we can convene at 11.30. Thank you.
We will now uh, continue uh, with our session scheduled for 11.30. Gary Schmidt, please tee it up. Yes, uh, Chair and Board, your next session is Project Turnkey Follow-Up. There are some very specific uh, answers we would like, staff would appreciate, specific questions staff would appreciate answers to. Stephen Madcourt County Council will tee that up for you for discussion. Thank you, Gary. Hello, Commissioners. Yes, this is just a follow-up on the a uh, property transaction called Project Turnkey for the acquisition of the Quality Inn off of uh, Sunnyside there. Last Wednesday, Chair Smith reversed her vote, thereby rejecting, declining to proceed with the acquisition 3-2. In order for us to get some direction, we'll need some uh, clarity from the board in terms of this was on the, the verge of closing and so there's money in escrow there's money in earnest money and if um typically what happens if a per party backs out of a real estate deal uh, there's the transfer of the earnest money to the seller so that's approximately one hundred fifty thousand dollars that we would need direction from the board are you authorizing staff to order to ask the title company to release the earnest money to the seller number one and number two are you directing staff to ask the title company to release the escrow dollars which are from the project turnkey funding in the amount of approximately eight million dollars to return that to the Oregon Community Foundation. What we have drafted for the board's consideration is a board order that I circulated to you yesterday that if um, you agreed with its content and direction, it would go to the consent agenda tomorrow, <clears throat> tomorrow morning for the board's consideration and ideally approval. What it does, it does those two things I've talked about, releases the earnest money, releases the escrow, and also auth delegates authority to sign all contracts and documents necessary to complete this transaction, basically unfold, un unfold it, unwind it, to the county administrator gives him uh, signing authority. And that would allow for, that would be the final board action, ideally on the particular um, quality in transaction itself. So the order I have in front of you, I've already made a few adjustments to it, a few edits to it, but we'll have a final version of it if the board approves of it, final version of it later today for posting and for circulation and again for ideally approval um, tomorrow. I did speak with the attorney for the Oregon Community Foundation and told them what we were hap what was happening today with the, with the board. And he also said that there would be um, a request by the OCF for payment of the due diligence costs, which were the appraisal, the inspection, and other out-of-pocket costs that the community foundation incurred as a result of this. They tallied them up to be approximately $20,000. And if nobody were to take advantage of that earnest money, or not earnest money, of those uh, due diligence um, documents, then the board would be responsible for repayment of those costs. But perhaps there's a buyer out there who would be able to take advantage of those exact documents themselves, the appraisal, the inspection, and things along those lines. And if that were the case, then the county would not be responsible for it. So I'm here to answer any questions that the board may have with respect to the draft order that we have in front of you. Thank you very much. Um, I see one commissioner wants to speak. I will entertain a motion to, uh, when the time is right, to to pay out the $150,000 earnest money to release escrow back to the Oregon Community Foundation and consider a repayment of the $20,000 due diligence in the event that another um, entity does not buy it. I understand there are some interest out there from other entities to purchase this for this reason. Um, I have not been approached. It's not up to this board to try to sell a property we don't own. It's up to the original owners to make that decision. Commissioner Savas and then Commissioner Scholl, you're in the queue. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair. Uh, as I mentioned yesterday, I first of all I apologize for being ill. I would have liked to have been here to, um, you know, opine and influence perhaps a, a different outcome. Uh, I want first of all I want to maintain that I um, am solidly behind the decision I made on February 16th, so I have no reservations um, and. 
Uh, I do understand that the decisions of my colleagues, um, and I respect that. I don't agree with it, but I respect it. Um, however, um, over the weekend, um, I came to uh, discover that there might be two to three entities or people, organizations that might be interested in acquiring the, the uh, quality end for similar purposes, um, not the exact purposes, um, but similar purposes. And um, while I do understand some of the constituents that were against this project, um, I, I understand their concerns and um, I would agree that if we were to operate this in a way that would make those fears come true and not run it the way we intended on running it, you know, I, I, I'm sensitive to that. But if we don't own it, we can't control it. Um, and, and we can't live up to the promises we made, including an agreement with the neighboring property owner, which would ensure that we would have a commitment you know, uh, an agreement that, you know, could go on in perpetuity to guarantee that those impacts would not be realized and we would run this in a safe uh, manner for the community and a productive manner uh, that helps the, the, uh, the cause in which we all seem to agree is important to us and this entire state. So um, I'm suggesting that we actually because of this, um, because as soon as we release the earnest money, we are no longer have any leverage. And as I understand it, we might have a couple different alternatives or possibilities. And I think we need just a little bit more time to flesh that out. Um, you know, maybe indeed we do do that. But as I understand I met with legal counsel this morning to make sure that we do have a little bit of time. Um, we don't have to do this today. I don't have any problem with the way if we choose to stay on the path, the way it's written, the, the board order, the way it's written. So I don't, I'm not here to influence that. But I'm just asking for a pause because we have the, actually an opportunity to um, perhaps, um, you know, have these funds realized in a way that um, might give us some opportunity to assure the community that it'll be ran uh, if one purchaser or another um, is interested that it would be ran in a way that would be closer to ours, uh, not as not as well, I don't think, and with not as much leverage to control it, make sure it's in, there's good outcomes. But I, I just don't want to turn my back on everyone involved, regardless where they are on this particular issue. The other thing I think is striking, I know that we said it in the presentation on February 16th, and I know in our PowerPoint there's a page or a, on the, yeah, there's a page or a slide on the PowerPoint that talked about the economics of this, the $3 million per year of additional cost. And um, uh, I just want to put that in terms that's more simple for people to understand. As I understand it, if we don't own it and we continue to increase the number of people using the supportive housing services dollars as, as charged, as defined, then we'll go from the average right now of $125 a night per room, um, that will, that will, that's what will we continue on that path of $125, whereas ownership is less than $35 when all expenses are accounted for as far as operating expenses, you know, power, heat, laundry, all those things that, that the facility would need. So spending an additional $90 a day per person, again, $35 versus $125, I, I just encourage you to look at the fiscal elements of this. Um, there's upside to, to making the purchase. There's upside for serving the, the, the community and the, mem the members of the community that need that assistance. And I think what really, um, uh, bothered me quite a bit was the campaign that was ran, uh, you know, against this, the petitioners, if you want to call them petitioners. Um, you know, they, they made it sound as though we're going to run a shelter that people could walk in and out of at any time and, and run it in a way that was contrary to what we messaged, what we had on our website. And um, uh, I, I don't think that was, I don't, I know, I know that's not accurate. I know that was not quite, quite accurate, but um, they might be upset, actually. Their worst fears might, might be realized here. So I just leave it there and just ask that we pause until next week um, and um, have some assurances that, that uh, um, how it will be owned or operated um, will be in a way that is in alignment with what we would like to see. 
Thank you, Commissioner Savas. We have two other commissioners in the queue, but um, Mr. Magcor, can you give us a legal opinion on the ownership, so to speak, of the earnest money? Can we Are we able to direct earnest money that belongs to somebody else? The earnest money is the 150 that I'm talking about, which would be given to the sellers in the event of a failure to complete the contract, the purchase sale agreement. There's also the escrow dollars, which are the Oregon Community Foundation grants that were awarded to Clackamas County through the competitive application process. That's the chunk of approximately $8 million that's sitting in escrow right now. So the earnest money is going to be on the county to, to, to pay. That's the 150. Is that what you're referring to, Commissioner Savas? No, Chair, I was not, at, no, not suggesting that we would not refund or be able to redirect the earnest money anywhere but back to um, the, um, the, the potential seller. Uh, my suggestion was simply to pause until uh, we can make sure, see who's interested in this, in this uh, property and um, that might, I think that might influence uh, our, our decision on whether or not we want it to be, you know, maybe the outcome of us pulling out might be worse than we actually ever anticipated. Um, if, the, if, if a potential owner doesn't run it, there are some great organizations out there that could purchase this and run it closer to what we want, but we still will not have the level of control or assurances to the community that it would be well ran and as protected as it could be, would be otherwise in, on, in the ownership model. So I'm not suggesting that if we do reverse course that we somehow re-steer the, the $150,000 $150, anywhere but the way it was intended to be, to be re, refunded, essentially. But, um, excuse me, Stephen Madcorn, we do need to refund the initial uh, deposit in escrow of the $8 million. I'm sorry, Chair, could you we repeat? We need to return the $8 million that's in escrow. If you're not going to use those dollars to acquire the quality yes. in, which was part of our application, which was part of our due diligence, then yes, this document, this order, directs staff to ask the title company to release those dollars that are in escrow back to the Oregon Community Foundation because okay. it's a grant that was awarded to the county, and if you're not going to use it for these purposes, you will return it. Yes. Uh, Commissioner Scholl, you're up. Yes. Good morning. Um, it's my understanding we're not here to discuss uh, or argue the merits of the purchase of the Quality Inn or the merits of not purchasing it. The BCC has made a decision not to do so. Uh, so, Mr. Madcor, uh, on the $8 million, uh, I see no other option, no other potential turnkey project that's been brought to the attention of the board that maybe we could potentially use that money on. So I, I feel that it should go back to the Oregon Community Foundation. Uh, my question for you, Mr. Madcore, is you've talked about the 150 k of the uh, earnest money. You've talked about uh, returning the uh, $8 million. Uh, can you tell us if there's any other potential costs or litigations coming from this action we're taking today? Uh, for example, is there any potential problem with Colliers International on this? I'd prefer to give my legal advice during executive session, but I've apprised the board of some of the possible risk associated with the, the board's withdrawing from this transaction yesterday. Yeah. Yes, there are legal risks that are presented by these actions, absolutely. I'm not sure that the ones that we're talking about today, the earnest money okay. and, and Oregon Community Foundation is it. I think there's others out there. I see. Well, that's just part of doing business, I, I think. All right, thank you. Commissioner Schrader. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. <clears throat> thank you, colleagues. I'm going to stand by the vote of the project. I believe that uh, it's unfortunate that we've come to an impasse uh, on this project with the commission. I also believe that if it is the county that has control over the property, 
that we have the opportunity to mitigate any negative uh, issues that may arise in that area. We have a track record of doing that, and that is largely our Veterans Village, where it is an intentional community. The whole notion of turnkey is that it is an intentional community with wraparound services on the site that will help people be able to succeed as they recover and get housing, whether it be mental illness, whether it be addiction, whether it be a slide into homelessness because of external circumstances. Uh, I will not be supporting this at this time today. Uh, and uh, if my colleagues disagree with me, that's fine because we all respect one another. I do concur with Commissioner Sabas that my concern is if we don't have control, uh, we would be seeing uh, another entity possibly uh, taking over. And again, we would not have an opportunity to influence a highly managed functional facility. So uh, thank you for that, colleagues. Uh, that's my statement. And um, I appreciate your allowing me to disagree with you publicly on this issue. Thank you, Commissioner Schrader. Commissioner West, you're up. Uh, Commissioner Schrader, I, I um, absolutely appreciate your perspective. Thank you. Um, and I know how heartfelt this is for you, and I appreciate that. Commissioner Savas, you, you mentioned something that I'm still trying to wrap my brain around. It's my understanding, and it, well, the, all of Clackamas County's understanding that, that we are not purchasing this hotel. That's not even up for debate. That's been decided. This board says no on purchasing it. However, um, Commissioner Savas, you're alluding to something with the, with the, with the money in escrow and um, that it looks like regardless of whatever we do, that somebody is really considering purchasing this regardless, right? And we have no control over that because we're not. I'm trying to understand your thinking around um, putting a pause on the money in escrow. Uh, can, can you take a second to, to tell me what your idea is or what's going on? Sure, I'll try to do a better job. Um, or the my, reasoning behind it? Yeah, my understanding is that um, we have the, well, out there for dollars for a project like this, there's the, the money from the state, the $8 million from OCF, right, that some, some of these folks might be able to, a, a, a organization might be able to apply for and get those $8 million. There's also the other, the other portion, there's two other segments of the other monies that could also be, we could, we could help facilitate that uh, to steer that to a, 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 pers a prospective owner, potential owner here, that would run it the way closer to what we would like, right? Um, if we don't, then perhaps another owner, another potential buyer comes in and, um, and possibly runs it in a way that is more Portland-like than might be what we were, you know, we were talking about more of a high barrier type of facility. So um, the pause is only a pause to help work that out and see if the board meets on Tuesday morning to talk about the details. Would this board be willing to um, use some of the dollars that have been assigned to Clackamas County um, that were for this purchase to steer them to assist the, the, what, we, what maybe we feel or agree on? I don't know if we do. We will. But maybe a more favorable owner than what we might otherwise experience. Does that help? Yeah, Mr. Medcourt, do we have the, is that possible? Do, is this something that's a reality that we would have the ability to do that? To do the pauses, the pause that Commissioner Savas recommends. Like, I don't know how this timelines, money in escrow, like, I'm, what's the, what's, because the money does have uh, yes, to go back to the state answer. eventually, right? Yes, is the short answer. You could, you could delay it. And there's other funds, there's eight million 
for Project Turnkey. There's 4.1 million from the Metro Bond, which the county has control over. There's 2.1 million, which is Oregon Health Authority, which was an award to the county as well. So you have control over a sizable amount of money uh, directed towards homeless services. And so the purpose of that would be for us to have a better handle or idea about what is f the future looks like for this property? How it's, man well, ultimately how it's, or who, who's, who owns it and how it's managed because there are people that are very successful doing this that are closer to a model that we like. And there's other folks out there that, you know, may not, may not run the way, uh, you know, other, another organization would. And I'm trying to be very careful with my wording. So, yeah, so hear me be a little bit hesitant in trying to reveal anything. I'm, yeah, I'm and I know there are things we can't talk about. Maybe you can't say directly right now. But I so so just thinking about it looks like regardless somebody is purchasing this. If we were to read the tea leaves or we were to guess, it's a little bit of a guess, but like we think there's a strong possibility somebody is going to do this. Yeah, I am certain. Uh, from my conversations is that there's interest in in a likelihood that this quality in will be purchased by someone else if we don't if we step out and the minute we get out of escrow when, when the minute we take this move it's on the market so we're pausing it from being on the market till Tuesday at least I'm, all I'm asking for a pause till Tuesday um, board I am willing to um, to join Savas's request on putting a pause until Tuesday Thank you, colleagues. I'm willing to do that as well because, Mr. Madcor, the question I was going to ask you, thank you, Chair, was there is no immediate urgency. We still have some time to consider it. I heard that as a yes from you, sir. Is that correct? Yeah. That, that's correct, Commissioner. Okay. Thank you so much. I think that this is such a uh, important decision we have to make. And again, my concern is that uh, if it moves into housing of this sort, that we make sure as a county that we have the side bit uh, sidebars there. Uh, particularly, I suspect we would move uh, towards a high barrier facility as well. Um, at least that is one of the models that I've heard uh, that I think will give some um, ease to people who, um, are fearful of outcomes uh, if we have homeless people there. I also want to remind everyone that we are doing this anyway. We provide vouchers for individuals to stay in motels and hotels. One of the issues we're finding, however, is if the wraparound services aren't there with those kinds of sidebars, that's when all those community uh, things happen that, that people who are in the area find somewhat disturbing because when people are uh, on the streets and just trying to survive, uh, there are behaviors that happen because they're really in survival mode and I've said that numerous times. So the whole point is to move them into an area of stability. Uh, I like to think, uh, get them clean and sober and then uh, use our assets to move them into more permanent housing. So. Commissioners, we're going to have a planning session this afternoon, and we're being rather redundant at this dais. The purpose for this particular session is do we return the earnest money, do we uh, pay out what's in escrow, and do we give the administrator signing authority? We have set aside hours this afternoon to discuss this. The homeless population in Clackamas County is still being served. My decision to change my vote was explained in detail in an op-ed piece that has been circulated. Everybody can have a chance to read that. As time continued, more and more people became opposed to this location. They were not convinced that this is the right location or this is how we should be handling the homeless population. I think it's our job to try to figure out what to do going forward. Commissioner Scholl, you're up. Yes, um, you know, we can ask our housing staff experts to share their draft management plan and their housing expertise with any potential buyer of the quality in uh, and thereby influence what might happen there should somebody else buy it. Uh, without delaying 
our decisions today. In other words, I'm ready to make a decision on returning the $8 million and relinquishing the 150 k Do I hear a motion? Money. Yes, I'd like to move that we approve the releasing the $150,000 earnest money and return the um, $8 million to the um, Oregon Community Foundation. Thank you. There's a motion on the table. Do I hear a second? I'll second the motion. Commissioner Scholl has moved to return the hundred to pay the hundred and fifty thousand dollars earnest money and return the escrow to the Oregon Community Foundation. And I'll also add direct signing authority to Gary Schmidt to carry out that. I concur with that. Uh, okay. Chair, just I a may. moment. I'm asking, just a minute, Mr. Savas. I'm asking for further direction on this and further discussion. There is a motion on the table that needs to be considered first. Now you may opine. Uh, Chair, I move the table. I'll second that. Can Gary, what supersedes the motion? supersedes the motion? All right, a motion to table does override the original motion. You have to vote immediately on the move to table. And then that determines if the original motion stands or not. Commissioner Saffis has moved to table the previous motion. Commissioner Schrader has seconded that motion. Any further discussion? Tony, take the poll. Commissioner West. Aye. Commissioner Scholl. No. Commissioner Schrader. Aye. Commissioner Savas. Aye. Chair Smith. Aye. Motion passes. 3-2. Hearing no further business before this commission, we are adjourned. Did you vote, did you vote right, yes, Chair? chair? It's 4-1. Did you vote yes or no, it's Chair? I voted, I, voted four, I voted no. I'm sorry, okay. Voted no. The motion passes 3-2. The table. To table the motion. Let's get some time. So the motion to table succeeds. Okay, right. That's right. Yes. Thank you. Hearing no further business before this commission, we are adjourned.